Joining me today are Edgar and Peter Schein, the founders of the Organizational Culture and Leadership Institute and co-authors of Humble Inquiry, which I'm proud to say I've read. I read the whole book. Thank you, thank you for sending that ahead of time so I could get ready for you, because this is going to be a fascinating conversation. So uh, I appreciate you joining us here on Drucker TV. Very happy to be here. Glad to be here. So one of the first things I want to ask about, let's say, let's just say most viewers, if they're smart, should agree that inquiry is the best way to go about doing business, right? Because you guys talk about in the book, inquiry versus telling. And so eventually, though, someone does need to take responsibility and tell uh, eventually, right? I mean, otherwise, there's no distance too long. I can't a can cannot be kicked. So does performance require responsibility and therefore telling to some degree? Absolutely. The trick is whether the resulting decision is <clears throat> wrongly based out of the appointed leader's belief in herself. That she thinks she knows the answer. So she's going to right off the bat take responsibility. Or does she realize that unless she inquires of the people around her what the situation actually is, what the relevant facts are, and allow a co-creation of what we must do, then the appointed leader can say, yes, this is what we must do. But because it's been co-created through Humble Inquiry with her team and with her direct reports so that the decision becomes a more valid decision. So I don't think we can argue against someone being accountable. The question is, do they achieve their decision in an appropriate inquiry way or do they believe that everything they think is valid automatically just because they're the appointed leader sure so i mean yeah go ahead peter i think there are the cases that um you know people in an organization know who the who, who the leadership is right there, there's no mystery there and it's often the case that you want to, to at some point be directed what to do um, I think the the dilemma is um, for the leader is to not to feel like they're in command mode, but that they're in directing mode. And directing has been has been based on gathering information from the group so that whether or not consensus was actually tested within the group, there's an implicit understanding that. Um, they're all on the same page. And so the decision and the direction that follows that decision feels natural and feels right. Yeah, so inquiry first, but then eventually it does get to a point where a leader will tell, assign, and hold people responsible. Provided <clears throat> what the leader tells has been sufficiently understood by the team and the direct report so that they will implement it correctly. Because one of the great flaws in many of the improvement programs is that the consultant or the leader will ask the workers or the employees, what should we be doing? And they will talk and he'll get ideas. And then he or she, as the expert, will make a decision and say, this is what we will do, but it's it hasn't really been vetted by the people who will have to implement it, so they may very well at that point still screw it up or sabotage it because they haven't been involved in the implementation effort. So inquiry also has to apply to, if this is our course of action, do you understand it? Will you do it? Do you agree with it? And get approval and consensus at the implementation level. Yeah. And so you probably find that approval, consensus, and buy-in 
is automatic at that point, right? Because if you're leading through humble inquiry and people are coming to these ideas on their own and you're, you're essentially a therapist or guiding them there, I'm, I'm assuming buy-in is pretty easy. And I, I'm assuming most leaders spend most of their wheels and most of their energy and time creating the plan. And then they spend even more time getting people to follow along. But if you're doing it the way you instruct, it sounds like the actual execution and getting people to do it and getting them to follow along is, I mean, is it too risky for me to say that's simple? Well, I think the trap is to use the word buy-in. Buy-in suggests mm that there is a possibility that they don't understand and that you have to sell it to them. The minute I get into buy-in, I'm in trouble. It should be obvious to the team what we're going to do. There shouldn't need to be any buy-in. Now, that makes a lot of sense. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah. I just the other thing is, you know, language is very important. And buy-in kind of reflects a mentality of a, of a transactional relationship between you as a leader and uh, people who um, are, you know, you are responsible for and are accountable to you. But that transactional relationship is what we're trying to move beyond here. We're trying to get to uh, a sort of a substrate of openness and trust so that buy-in is no longer really the issue. It's... Yeah. Is, have we, have we shared information completely enough to be ready to make a decision? Because then there shouldn't be any need for buying. You mentioned uh, transac transactional leadership, and um, I'm, I'm glad you went there because traditional hierarchy organizations, right? They're structured on very strict rules. Like you said, transactional leadership. Um, and these are... Uh, as you write in Humble Inquiry, you kind of touch on this briefly, but these are things AI is getting increasingly good at, right? Transactional, rules-based, very strict. And so entrepreneurial companies, they're dealing with more complexity. They're dealing with cultural diversity. They're dealing with relational leadership. So, you know, stuff AI can't really do that well. So does Humble Inquiry empower entrepreneurial organizations to beat AI-led organizations, or I guess I maybe should say this more simple, uh, does Humble Inquiry insulate our companies from AI disruption? Yes, in one sense, that <clears throat> during the industrial age, the last maybe 50, 100 years, the problems were simple, complex, machine-like types of problems where AI and having everyone become a cog in the wheel and get it all organized, probably worked okay. The transactional mode works well for simple, well-structured problems. But the internet, the growth of technology, uh, the social changes in the young generations have made today's problems unbelievably complex, volatile, uh, so that the, even the best AI can't possibly handle it. So humans have to step in with their more divergent uh, ability to process stuff and uh, deal with what many people are now calling wicked problems because they don't even lend themselves to solutions, only to carefully adapting uh, a next step to get to move forward but the environment will have changed by the time we've taken step one. <clears throat> so it, it may become a perpetual process that AI may not, may never be able to handle. I think it does, it, there are certain functions though, <clears throat> certain parts of a, of a value chain that may lend themselves very well to a sort of AI automation where there are very clear handoffs, functions and handoffs, um, you know, that, that, is, that is a throughput function that an AI might be able to, to handle perfectly well. But when what's required is something that's more hand in hand than handoff, I think that's where, uh, where we see there's that inoculation we're talking about. Could an AI really participate in a um, 
design thinking exercise or um, an agile sprint? Probably not. That's, that's what we're saying. There's certain functions where it just may not be necessary to be hand in hand, where a handoff is sufficient. So maybe that's part of the business that gets automated. So if an organization is mostly, I like that by the way, hand in hand versus handoff. Um, if an organization feels as, as though it's in a position where it's mostly handoff, they're kind of in trouble unless they change that into a hand in hand organization. Well, trouble meaning um, they could be, you know, they're, they're facing an innovator's dilemma. Right. They're very good at the old business. They have no idea how to get to the new business. And our argument in a lot of our books is that that new business that you need to be getting to is coming faster. The rate of change is accelerating. You have to be um, more agile. You have to be more willing to kind of uh, change your own way of working um, at an increasing rate. And so there may be businesses that are quite comfortable um, as primarily sort of throughput, handoff oriented, um, maybe have no interest in, in, you know, finding new business to get into. Those number of businesses, though, that can be comfortable in that mode is shrinking, right? And more and more companies have to be innovating because they are being disrupted by other innovators. <laughs> well, can I add a related issue, the issue Please. of safety? If you get into the safety arena, the first thing you discover is that in, the, in medicine, in healthcare, one of the biggest problems of safety is the handoff between the doctor and the, the next uh, person handling the, uh, the ICU or the ward. So if, if we think of communication as just a handoff, we're in trouble because the communication process itself is so complicated. And now we're finding the same thing in the safety area in the cockpit. If the communication between the captain and the, uh, the number one officer isn't a level two communication, there are really horrendous cases where the crash happened because of poor communication between these two people. Yeah, in some cases, I, I truly, I'm sorry, were you finished? I just wanted to say the safety area is where I've learned the most about the necessity of not assuming simplicity. Things that seem like simple handoffs often are not. That's interesting. And that's, that's, that's fascinating you brought that up because one of the things I've noticed about healthcare in some capacity is that uh, much of it seems to be replaceable by AI, at least much of it that I see. And what you're saying is, uh, you know, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what you're saying is that may be true and that's a problem within the healthcare industry that they are doing a handoff situation. Maybe healthcare could improve if they were more hand in hand. But I'll let you respond to that because I don't want to be unfair to you. Well, I mean, one thought is that what, what we've done a lot of work with different healthcare systems and we usually start with the basic notion that it's a socio-technical system. It's both. It cannot be just an, an AI automated system because you're dealing with human beings. At some point, the, the social skills that are required between a doctor and a patient, and a patient um, also become very important um, in, you know, in the pace and complexity of, of dealing with the, the functions of the hospital or the healthcare system itself. Wow. It's not just about the bedside manner. Um, you need to be, you know, sort of presenting that same face within, you know, the, the subsystem of the hospital, within a ward or in a huddle or in an OR. Um, that same level of human to human communication is very valuable. Mm. It's, and it's usually the thing that separates um, you know, uh, errors from successful procedures. Wow. Um, you know, lots of things can go wrong. And if the 
surgeon and all of the other supporting cast in a complex operation are not communicating fully, um, things can go wrong. And so, so, and the, the, the they might, may not be things that would show up, you know, in the, you know, in the metrics of an AI, right? Or yeah. in the perception of the subtle things that humans are very good at perceiving that they need to be sharing. Yeah. In complex. I mean, can you, we'll move on, but can you imagine if our healthcare system uh, in the world, but, you know, I'm, I obviously live in the U.S., but if the healthcare system led the way you lead and the way you talk about humble inquiry, I imagine we'd have far, far better patient outcomes and far less cost for individuals. I think it would be incredible to see that. Uh, with our final four minutes here, I do want to say, um, I'm trying to, I always try to anticipate what are some areas people will push back because you, you've heard probably thousands of reasons that people don't have time to ask a bunch of questions. I'm the know-it-all boss. I know everything. And uh, you know, pr probably notice I snuck that in there, the know-it-all boss. But there may be someone who does think they have all the answers. So, I mean, I agree inquiry is far superior as a way to motivate people. And a as you point out, coaches and therapists use it for a reason. We discussed that in the top of the interview. But the leader may say, hey, it requires time I don't have. So is there ever a time when commanding and just getting it done and not listening to people is, appro is, a is appropriate? Or is humble inquiry always the best, most efficient way to lead an organization? The basic misunderstanding is that it takes time. Mm -hmm. I have learned when someone asks me for advice, I can take immediately say, well, tell me what's worrying you. We only have two minutes. What's going on? I can be very directive in forcing them to be clear what they want me to help with. And that does not take a lot of time, but it is still humble inquiry. Peter? Where do we get the idea that endless questions is the way it works? It's the kind of question, the, the mutual recognition, we don't have time to think about it, but I, the advice giver, the, the autocratic manager still can say, what the hell is going on? You've got 20 seconds to tell me. And, and I guess our general argument about advice would be, um, you better be really sure you know what's going on before you try to advise somebody. Right? That's a, you know, people may come and ask you for advice, but you don't, you don't know that that's what they really want. You need to, to to, to draw them out a little bit before you you should feel at, at all qualified to give advice. Um, it's and and I would I guess I would say the same thing about um, you know tough directions tough you know decisions in a uh, in a crisis. Um, you as the leader are you're you're going to gain more by drawing other people out and figuring out what they know than just you know being decisive and feeling that that decisiveness is actually going to get you to a better outcome. It might, but the odds are lower that it will. If you don't draw people out and figure out what they know that's going to, in, that's going to be direct inputs into the decision. And I like what you say in the book with our final minute. Um, you, you were very clear, and I'm glad you put this in here because I'll, I'll be honest, um, I've done this. I've done it, and it didn't work well for me. As you point out in the book, it would not. Um, you basically say, don't try to manipulate people with humble inquiry. Don't try to tell them what you want them to do through a series of questions because it will backfire. And I can 100% attest to that. I've tried it. I wish I would have read your book sooner because it doesn't work. And actually, what it really does, would you be willing to say last 30 seconds and just real briefly, if you try to do that and manipulate people in that way, does it really destroy relationships? And uh, are those relationships destroyed for quite some time? Well, I, um, yeah, I just want to say quickly what the minute the gut check for that manipulation is. Are you asking questions that you don't know the answer to? Yeah. Because the way you, you come across as manipulating 
is when you ask questions that you do know the answer to and you're clearly leading the person on. Yeah. And people have very good radars for that. And that's a people great, know. that's a really good place to leave it. Edgar and Peter Schein, founders of the Organizational Culture and Leadership Institute and co-authors of Humble Inquiry. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you for great, having great us. Great discussion. Right.